Any other reason why we might want to, <clears throat> in contrast, why not just let Congress decide these questions? Right? The alternate view, the British view, would be if we're going to have a question about uh, affirmative action or guns, gun control or abortion, Congress can, as our elected representatives, look at the Constitution and then pass the laws they think are consistent. So why require this third party to you know, sort of be the adjudicator? How about right here? <clears throat> I think it stems from the fear of tyranny of the majority um, mm -hmm. that the founders are very concerned with. They wanted kind of experts of law that they assumed would be non-partial to evaluate the laws Congress was making to ensure that kind of this majority tyranny wasn't taking place. And on a historical note, the Supreme Court back in the day was in the basement, and it was mostly from state Supreme basement Court justices of, basement of Congress. Of Congress. And they did not want to be on the Supreme Court. They actually usually rotated in and out of their state Supreme Court because that was more prestigious at the time. So it is not what it is today. So, <clears throat> right, so when you, one thing, this is not necessarily uh, the Supreme Court alone, but you could say having the separation of powers at all is a way to combat uh, tyranny. Actually, justices today and the founders back in the day would talk about uh, dispersing power within the national government. Right? But that doesn't necessarily still answer the question. Right? You could have just said, let's just have it dispersed between the president and the Congress and the states. Why? What, what does the judiciary add? Anyway, the other point you make is, even with all that, the Supreme Court was very deferential to the results of the political process for much of its history. So the first law it ever struck down was uh, Marbury versus Madison, <clears throat> uh, which was about a very technical, unimportant law, actually. It was about whether some justice of the peace had a right to his commission of office. Uh, it really was not, had very little importance. The second one, though, was Dred Scott. That was the second federal law ever struck down by the Supreme Court. And that was, as those of you know your Civil War history, this was the Supreme Court overturning uh, the Compromise of 1850 and thought to be one of the uh, contributing events to the coming of the Civil War. Those are the only two laws ever struck down by Congress before the Civil War. Other than that, con the court didn't use this great power very often. They usually would accept what Congress did. Is there someone over here? I saw a hand earlier about why should we allow, sure, why should we allow the Supreme Court to decide these great questions uh, before us today? So my name is Parker. I go to the Colorado School of Mines. The, so James Madison makes this argument in one of the Federalist Papers, and it's fairly similar to the argument that was made over here, but that when you have one branch of government in charge of legislating powers, mm -hmm. you have one branch of government in charge of enforcing those powers, and you have a federal government that is a government of restricted jurisdiction. They have enumerated powers they must follow. Those restrictions become ineffectual if those are the parties you assign as being responsible for controlling themselves. So you must have a third party that's sole job is to restrict the rules that the others can play by and what they can do. That's the argument James Madison yeah. makes. So th that's good. Actually, Alexander Hamilton makes this argument in Federalist Number 78. He sort of argues, well, the Constitution is, uh, sets out limited powers for the federal government. Notice, actually, in our system, the states have basically powers that are unlimited other than the Bill of Rights. Or you already had a session on the Bill of Rights with uh, Judge McConnell. Uh, but for states, states have what's called the police power. They can do anything other than violate the Bill of Rights. Right? So Berkeley can tell me, I have to pay more money for sugar drinks. They can tell me I'm not allowed to have plastic bags. They, well, we can go on and on. So, right? So Berkeley, uh, Berkeley and the state of California, they can legislate at all. But the federal government is one of enumerated limited powers, right? That's part of the idea that you were mentioning before about history. Why, what's one important thing about our history is we were the one, the first country with a written constitution. And one thing Marshall said in Marbury is, the fact that it's written is important. It's because it's a limit. It's a delegation from the people to the government of what it's allowed to do. And so we wrote it down rather than, and here's the other possibility, which was the British example, which Marshall and the founders were afraid of, was a government that defined its own powers for itself. And so they say, oh, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And so you want a branch that's going to stop it. 
Right. Uh, Madison actually did not rely heavily on judicial review. He thought uh, that you divide the powers by splitting up Congress, right? having a House and a Senate with equal powers but elected differently, and then having a president who could veto the bill, and then having states which could protest and refuse to cooperate. I think about today, what's going on with the president's immigration initiatives? There are a lot of states, including this one, which have ordered their officials not to cooperate with federal law enforcement officers in enforcing the immigration laws. It's completely within their prerogatives. Right? They're independent government, so they don't have to. They can cooperate, but they don't have to. Madison thought that would be an important check also. Yeah. Good. One last idea, and this is uh, its so kind of old that none of you probably thought of it. it. It's a little bit related to your first point, but it's sort of an 18th century idea was that Judicial review, the power would just flow naturally out of the thing that the judges do that's unique to them, which is decide cases or controversies. Right, so you just put it out, the Congress legislates, the president executes. What's the judiciary do? They don't rove around the country saying, you're going too far, you're going too far. Right, they decide cases, legal cases. And when you decide legal cases, maybe you don't want people who are trained at the law. And the legal cases will sometimes, rarely, but sometimes call on you to decide this law is unconstitutional. We have to obey the higher law of the Constitution. So it's not even that the Supreme Court has a special duty to interpret the Constitution. It's just that it happens to do it as part of its job. Right? But this goes to the separation of powers point. There's no reason that congressmen and congresswomen should say, we never hear them say this now, but they should say, I love this bill but I'm not gonna vote for it because it's unconstitutional. Right? They should interpret the Constitution. And a president, we don't really see this anymore. Uh, I have to say President Bush, for whom I worked, he actually signed a bill that he said, I think this bill is unconstitutional, but I'm gonna sign it anyway because it's the Supreme Court's job to tell us whether it's constitutional. That's how far we've come. Early on, presidents thought they had to, un they had to veto bills that violated the Constitution, even if they supported the policy of the bill. We've kind of lost all that, right? We've gone, that, that was the original idea of the separation of powers. And now we've come to a world where we want, all the other branches want the Supreme Court to do it. Right? Any other points anyone wants to make this before we talk about? I'm putting you on the Supreme Court now. How would you interpret some of these questions? But, but go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to add the, um, perhaps the British. Stand up. Sorry. I just wanted to add... And your name? Noah, sorry, my name's Noah Westcombe from okay. the University of Oxford. Um, I was hoping to... Oh, you're British. You should be comfortable talking in front of people teaching I... us how we're mispronouncing the English language here. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> um, Happy to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to perhaps uh, get your thoughts on or perhaps just open it up uh, to question the difference between uh, the congressional authority and yeah. what the role Parliament plays. Good. I think those two are very different. Mm -hmm. and they've changed the role that the Supreme Court has played um, in comparison between the US. So, and what is the, the difference? What's, what's the difference? Well, while constitutional matters are still discussed in the House of Lords mm -hmm. nowadays, and they do advise that Mr. Speaker on those issues, um, they play a very different role in the sense that yeah. they are not specialised in the in the application of particular principles in terms of legal power. Those legal mm -hmm. constructions. And so that approach is quite important in figuring out what kind of interventions are appropriate depending mm. on what kind of role individuals play in those processes. So yeah. I think Parliament does respond to that in a slightly different way to Congress. So oh yeah, people, this is a good point. So people who are critical of judicial review here in the United States sometimes make exactly this point. They say, um, what's happened is because we have all, you know, the people, you know, if you look at opinion polls, a vast majority of Americans think it's the Supreme Court's job to answer all these questions. As I was just saying, presidents want the Supreme Court to answer the questions. Congress does. The theory behind it, I mean, I don't know if anyone has taken political science on this, but the idea behind it is, who wants to vote on abortion or affirmative action if you're a member of Congress and you gotta get reelected? I don't wanna vote on gun control. Let the Supreme Court decide. Right? So there's been this movement of accountability over constitutional questions to the courts. Critics of that say, 
look, if we got, if judicial review were severely narrowed, it's not like we won't decide constitutional questions anymore. It would just shift to, and look at England, look at the United Kingdom. They debate constitutional questions far more than we do in Parliament, and in the House of Lords, but also in the House of Commons. It's very rare to see major constitutional debates in Congress. But if you read, right, if you read the early debates of our Congress, they almost debated nothing else but the Constitution, right? Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, all these people, John Calhoun, right? We're not allowed to say his name anymore, I'm told. But John Calhoun, they filled the debates on the floor of Congress with debates about the Constitution, and that's, right? similar to the British experience, but then we shifted the power out. So some people say, well, we could return to that, and maybe that's healthier, because we'll have a fuller debate amongst the people about constitutional meaning, not just fighting over nominees. That's the other side effect, right? If you can't have this full debating legislatures, as you say, then if you're a person who really cares about abortion, what's the most important political thing you can do? fight over Supreme Court nominees. That's why it's not just Kavanaugh. This has been going on for 30 years now, these really partisan fights about justices. You might be shocked, but 50 years ago, justices wouldn't even show up for their confirmation hearings because they were so short. Justice White, who was appointed in 1962, I don't even think he had a confirmation hearing. He actually showed up at the hearing, and they said, oh, it's over. You can go. We already voted you out unanimously because still the debates were in Congress. So now, right, this is actually an argument Justice Scalia first made. If our most important political questions go to the Supreme Court, then the political fighting that surrounds those issues is also going to move to the Supreme Court. And so some people say Britain has avoided that by keeping it in the parliament. A very good point. So you have a point? Yeah, very small point. It can be a big point. You could, you could introduce the theory of constitutional interpretation that's been eluding us for 200 years. I was hoping I would get to that in my second <laughs> Very good. I'm Michael Smith, formerly of Princeton. Um, <clears throat> but, but to your account of Marshall's thinking um, of, of the judge's purview over both interpreting and, and ruling on the law, um, in, in Marbury v. Madison, Marshall says that it's, or his language is, it's emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department. Does that mean... To say what the law is. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in your account, does that mean that he thinks that it's judges going back Blackstone and earlier, or is it the particular separation of powers that imbue the judges with that power? Yes, it's the latter. That's where that, what that phrase means is that right, the primary job of the legislature is to pass laws. The primary job of the president is to execute them. Then the primary job of the courts are in the course of deciding a dispute to say this is the law. But notice it's not a claim to saying we get to decide what the Constitution means over everybody else. Right? You could, this is Thomas Jefferson's view, for example. He thought all three branches were equal when it came to interpreting the Constitution. And so no one branch could bind the other ones. We don't have that system now. But that was a system, I think, that you know, because of the centralization of constitutional discussion in Congress, really, and with the president, it wasn't clear until much later that the Supreme Court would have the final supreme say. Yeah. So people take that language from Marbury and use it to justify what we call today judicial supremacy, the idea that the judiciary is supreme in the interpretation of the Constitution. It's a concept that doesn't arrive until the 20th century, really. 